So today's um, topic is heartfelt matter, embrace inner connection. So before I start this, I'll also like to thank Tina and everyone who has made this possible because it is not only about the hard work or the efforts that we've put in together, but also the, um, the, the thoughts in our hearts that we would like to make everyone experience meta, experience loving kindness, at least have a smile on our faces. So today's topic is heartfelt meta, embrace inner connection. Um, when I was thinking about this topic, it's actually some things that I would like to share with you, some of the things that I've been considering for some time. How do we connect with ourselves? There is this, um, this monk, Venerable Master Sing Yun, he's my teacher. So I'm currently with his um, foundation, Sing Yun Education Foundation. So there was this famous quote that he always used is, we are not born into this world for suffering. We came to this world for joy and happiness. I'm sure most of us would be able to relate to this and definitely we want happiness, not suffering. But have we thought for ourselves, you know, how much of my time or how much of my life is on nearer to the suffering side and how much of it is nearer to the happy side? You know, we are on both ends, moving from A to B and B to A again, but where do I hope that I will be? Definitely happiness. But however, while I'm on this path on happiness or while I'm feeling happy, there is this element of suffering somewhere. So suffering and happiness, most of the time, it may come together. It may be both, it may be one, it may be one on each side. So whatever it is, this is a phrase by uh, my teacher, Venerable Master Sing Yun, and he actually passed away early this year at the age of 97. So he was actually born in an era of wars and really difficult times, but how did he overcome the external difficulties, the difficulties of war, of conflicts, and also to the end of his life, the last 10 to 20 years, he was actually down with, he was diabetic, he was down with strokes and he was almost blind. How did he overcome that and live in his life of happiness? So at the end of his days, he always says that I am a happy person. How did he do it? So what is happiness? When we are discussing or talking about embracing heartfelt matter, what is happiness? Have we asked ourselves about this? Why do we long for happiness? Um, this may be a difficult answer, a difficult question to answer, because we do long for happiness. None of us do not want happiness. But why? Why do we long for happiness? And also the last question, are you happy? So I've got, we have got some people on site here today, and also I believe there are quite some people online as well. Can you just have a show of hands, you know, tell me, are you happy? Okay, hands are coming up, but not everyone. Hands are, you no know, up and down, whatever it is. We do have our own definition of happy. What is happy? 100% happy, 50%, maybe that's also being happy. Just 10%, at least I'm 10% happy. So this is actually a very personal um, answer to are you happy? But definitely we do long for happiness. So when I just came in here, I saw this banner about Meta Center, a place to heal the mind, body, and the heart. With inner peace comes world peace a place to heal the mind, body, and the heart. I believe that there is a lot of um, discussions about mindfulness. Um, most of us here would have done meditation somehow, somewhere. And we know that mindfulness, perhaps the easiest uh, definition of that is to focus and be aware. Mindfulness, to be focused and be aware. 
But sometimes we would say that, oh, you forgot something. You are not mindful. Does you are not mindful being mind mindfulness and forgetfulness, are they just really two sides of the coin? I'm not mindful, therefore I tend to forget. Or I'm more mindful, therefore I'm more focused on my journey to healing, on my journey to happiness, on my journey to enlightenment. What is that? Is being mind less mindful equal to forgetfulness? I'm not too sure. We can have our, un so our own answers to this. So there are a few Chinese words that I came, um, came up with, that I saw, and I'd like to share with you. That's very interesting, irregardless of whether you know Chinese or not, but just see the element of this. The first word that you see, the one beside too busy, minds are full, not available for others. Look at the Chinese word. The, the part on the left um, with a dot, a stroke and a dot, that's the heart. On the right, a dot, um, a line, a horizontal line, and that, it's to die. So the heart, it's full, okay? The heart has died. The second word again, on top, you could see that this second word on top is the same as the first word on the right, right? So it means um, not around anymore. Then the bottom is also the heart again. It's the heart not around, which means to forget. Okay, that's the two. So if the heart is not around, we are too busy, our minds are full, not available for others, we forget. But the third word here, you could see on your left again, it's the heart. On the right is to come alive. It could be life, living, or to come alive. So here with a heart that is coming alive or a heart that is alive, it is a heart that is capable of being happy. So what is mindfulness here again? Are we able to come back to ourselves, to observe, to ask ourselves if my heart or my mind is still around? If my heart, my mind is around, then ask myself, is it living? Is it just an object, you know, a, men a physical object being around? Or is it a physical and mental state of awareness where it is living, capable of a better existence, which in today's case will be meta or happiness? Then, mindful, living fully in this present moment. It is only with a heart that is alive are we able to be mindful. So, um, this is the Buddhas in the Nantian Temple. I believe a lot of people have been to the temple. And um, personally, I loved these Buddha statues. They are so alive that Whenever I see them, I feel that I'm going into the Buddha, going with the Buddha. So at this moment, just take a look at the Buddha statues, sit up straight, and we will have a very, very, very short meditation. So just sit up straight, gently close your eyes. The purpose of this short experience is to allow us to be mindful and to refocus. So sit up straight, gently close your eyes, relax your body, and concentrate on your breath. As you breathe in, count one. Breathe in, two. Breathe in, three. Continue to meditate.
Now gently put your palms together. Rub your palms. Feel the warmth that you are generating. Rub your palms and feel the warmth that you yourself is generating. With the warm palms, massage your face, massage your ears, your shoulders, your arms, and gently open your eyes. Okay, that was extremely short, perhaps the shortest that you have ever done. But whatever it is, at the end of that little experience, that little exercise, how did you feel? Did you feel that, yeah, there was a moment of quietness and now I'm actually more focused? Or at least I was able to feel the warmth that I am generating. I'm capable of generating warmth. But there was one thing that I was observing everyone. Some people were smiling, some people forgot to smile. Okay, so when we are meditating, it's a time for us to relax it is a time for us to focus. It is also a time for us to remember that we are able to generate the warmth for ourselves and hence able to pass to share the warmth with others. We do have this capacity. And one of the most um, visible way to, to see, to test if we are on the right track is whether we are smiling or not. If we are able to smile, that means we are on the right track. That sh that's what I should say. <laughs> so now we come to this. While we are on our way to find happiness or uh, on our way to work out happiness, on our way to achieve happiness, we have a mind. We did a bit of meditation just now to remind ourselves that we are able to focus we are able to generate warmth. But what is this mind that I'm having? The Buddha always tells us that all sentient beings are equal. What makes us equal? At this moment, physically, th the things that we see around us, we are not exactly the same. I'm standing while most of you are sitting. I'm speaking while most of you are listening, hopefully. Okay. So there are some connections between us, but we do look different. What is the thing that makes us equal? Or from the Buddhist perspective, why are sentient beings equal? It is because of the mind. I am as dignified as you are. You are as dignified as myself. And that dignity is, in the Buddhist terms, the Buddha nature. That is our capacity to be the best that we can be, in the Buddhist terms again, to be the Buddha. So just remember the warmth that we were generating. That is our capacity to be the best that we could be. So in the Buddhist, Buddhist um, understanding of the mind, there is this terminology called the beginner's mind. I think now I could see that on Zoom, there are about 70 people on Zoom. And with our capacity here, I think we have about 100 people in this session. Where is your mind? Is it here? Is it here? Or is everything altogether the mind? And what is in the mind? You know, some people would say that I'm new to Buddhism. I'm only a beginner. Some people would say that I've been here for years. I'm an expert. Who is an expert? Who is the beginner? In the Buddhist um, sutras and also the text, there is a lot of emphasis on not forgetting the beginner's mind, not forgetting the time when you just started. So if your mind is empty, it is always ready for anything. It is open to everything. But so in the beginner's mind, there are a lot of possibilities. So on the other hand, if you're an expert, you would say that, ah, I know everything, therefore I do not need anything else. So who are we? If we are on our way, our journey to seek happiness, if we are on our journey to achieve happiness, to be with happiness, to be happy, perhaps the beginner's mind, the mind that is empty, the mind that is opened and ready to take in all the good nutritious things, 
all the good dharma will be a step forward, will be the basic requirements for us. So in the expert's mind, there are few possibilities. So the beginner's mind is also the mind of compassion because I want to be better. I hope that I could achieve happiness. I hope that I could share happiness with someone else. That is the mind of compassion. And when our mind is compassionate, I'm not only trying to seek happiness for myself, but I would like to share the happiness that I have with all other sentient beings, with all everyone else who would be as happy in that state of mind, which we call compassion, that state is boundless. Because I wouldn't say that I hope that I'm happy. I hope that three other people are happy. So what happens if you are number four? Sorry, I can't make you happy because you happen to be number four. No, a capacity of this room, a physical room, perhaps is a hundred. It's 200. It depends on the seats. It depends on the space. But in our mind of compassion, there is no boundary. It's not about a hundred or 1,000. It's just immense. There is, it's infinite. There is no number attached to compassion. So then we are always true to ourselves in sympathy with all beings and can actually practice. You know, the mind of compassion, it is not only about theory, I'm happy, I hope that you are happy, therefore all of us are happy. It is not that simple, actually. It is about ourselves, we want to be happy. I'm using this word happy that, you know, we are, it's easier for us to, under, to, to understand. We have always to be true to ourselves. The first three questions that um, I started the discussion with, are you ha what is happiness? Why do we long for happiness? Are you happy? We do have to answer these very personal questions because every one of us have our own set of issues. I have my part of happiness. I have my set of suffering. No good and bad. You know, A and B. Every one of us have our unique set. So we always have to be true to ourselves and also understand that while I have my set of whatever, you do also have that set. You know, in times of sympathy with all other beings, this is only when, this is only the time where we could actually practice compassion. Because I understand that you do have your specialities like me, you do have your difficulties like me. So, as we move from mindfulness to the beginner's mind, then we come to this heartfulness. So the topic was heartfelt matter. How do I feel meta? I'm not reading meta, thinking meta, um, imagining meta, but feeling meta, heartfelt. I can feel it, heartfulness. What is heartfulness? Have we ever asked our Selves a question, who am I? Anyone? Have you asked yourself, who am I? Maybe some people have and some people haven't. But just this question, if I were to ask, if somebody were to ask me, who am I? Then perhaps you'll read my bio. And But is that bio exactly what, who am I? It may not. It only tells you that my current um, name card, whatever that's on my name card, but what else is not on my name card? Perhaps that's me. I'm a venerable. I'm a um, resident nun of the Nantian Temple. I've been a monastic for more than 20 years. Um, I, I'm from, I'm, I'm, I wasn't born in Australia. I was from a particular country. I received education somewhere. Then I came here. So there are a lot of uh, parts, ingredients, sections experiences that I have been through but we are essentially mixed there was once um, I, I was born in Singapore so after my first degree in Singapore I went to Taiwan because I wanted to become a nun so I went to Fokwangshan temple and was um, so 
I joined the Foguangshan Buddhist Order under Venerable Master Sing Yun. So the first 20 plus years of my life was in Singapore, speaking the Singaporean language. With my parents, all my family are there. I'm just a Singaporean. Then the second part was because I wanted to become a nun. In my pursuit of this monastic life, I went to Taiwan, then to China. One thing that really happened to me was that my accent changed. So now I would tell myself that I, will, I would always say that I'm a Singaporean, I'm still holding the passport, but the way that I speak is totally different from my parents, my siblings, and anyone in my family. So I don't speak like them. One day I went home, that was about 10 years back. I was uh, residing in China at that time. So I went home, I was, I was in my mom's place on the, in the lift. Going home, I was, there were three people in the lift. A gentleman, some, somebody, a resident of that, the building. So my mother and myself, I was talking to my mother and that gentleman asked me, are you from China? No, I was like, oh, I'm back home. You asked me whether I'm from China. What's the difference? It's just an accent. So along our way, we always think that this is my family. This is my country. You know, this is me. But in our experiences, somehow we have, we actually taken certain elements that were not originally who I am. I don't speak like my mom. And that guy says that, are you from another country? Just based on the accent. So who am I? We are essentially mixed. But most of the time, we will have texts on ourselves to tell myself that, hey, I am this. This tag is correct. But there are more texts, more elements that we have taken along the way that we may not have recognized or we do not want to recognize. But I am as mixed as I am. And I believe that every one of us here, there are different experiences that we have brought with us, we have experienced. And these elements have become part of ourselves. So how do I understand who am I? There is this diversity and inclusiveness. Um, this is part of a lot of um, a lot of uh, researches or a lot of practices around corporates or organizations. You know, this Australian country, um, there is a lot of emphasis on diversity and inclusiveness as a country, as a community. But now if we were to just look at ourselves, we ourselves are quite diversified actually because of our different experiences and how do we see a knowledge and see ourselves, the diversity in ourselves and hence able to include the different elements in myself. If I'm able to understand just this for myself, most probably we would also be able to understand that you are as diverse as me, which means you are as mixed as me, and hence there is this possibility for inclusiveness, to include someone that is different from me. Nobody, everyone is unique. No, nobody is exactly the same. So back to mindfulness, we started that mindfulness is to focus, be clear and be calm. This is what we understand, to see things as they really are. So if we are talking about heartfelt matter, to really connect with ourselves, we have to understand that we ourselves are diversified and we need to have a bigger heart to be able to embrace all these differences. So humans are essentially mixed paradox and ambiguity reside at the heart of human conditions. Our failures are also our successes. Our suffering is our joy. Our imperfections prove to be the very source of our longing for perfection. Why do we long for happiness? Because I'm not happy enough. If I'm perfectly happy, perhaps there wouldn't be this part in me to long for happiness. So this phrase here, it tells us that 
sometimes failure and successes, suffering and joy, they do come together in a way. And the negative parts that we do not want failures, sufferings, perhaps they are the elements that will push us towards successes and joy. Nobody is perfect, but we embrace the imperfection in ourselves for the possibility to be better. Mixed consciousness only by embracing, seeing things as they are. So now we are on this stage where we should be going on to a deepened awareness and understanding of human diversity. So it's actually from me to we. So we are opening expansive sense of living with openness and clarity, being true to ourselves, acting in sympathy with all beings, and be able to vaccinate with and being part of the world around us. So just like the banners telling us that Meta Center, a place to heal the mind, body, and the heart, with inner peace comes world peace. From me to we, world, who is the world? It's just we. So from me to we, it's about connection, inclusion, then transformation. And this is heartfelt matter, embrace inner connection. So we have been discussing about this mindfulness, compassion. If we are on our way to, to be part of world peace, I believe that all of us would like to, to live in a place where it's happy and peaceful. If we are on this path towards world peace, there is this element about responsibility because world peace definitely comes with me being a responsible citizen of the world. So compassion is calm, passion, feeling with heartfelt matter. Matter doesn't mean that, oh, I'm happy, that's it. It's something that I have feeling with. I have feeling with for myself. I have feeling for another person another community somewhere and hence it makes compassion or matter possible. So sometimes we emphasize the purpose through connecting to something larger than the individual self, which is finding meaning in making a difference in the life of others. We are always very devoted to ourselves trying to find meaning for ourselves, trying to find success for ourselves, trying to find joy for ourselves. We are actually devotees of ourselves, devoted 100%. But in a world where we are trying to seek world peace, from inner peace to world peace, we do have to find meaning in making a difference to the lives of others. Which on the other hand, someone else would have to try to find meaning in making the lives of others, which is me. And this is how interconnectedness comes about. So the whole person, I started, just now we were discussing about who am I, then the whole person. Heartfulness is opening and cultivating the heart through inner stillness, mindfulness and silence, becoming more human more compassionate, more responsible, both to one's own life and to all other beings. Heartfulness is becoming more human. Human, we started with joy and suffering. We understand that suffering is just a part that is um, unsatisfaction, dissatisfied. But on the other hand, the possibility of Joy is always there. The ability for us to generate warmth, the ability of us to become more compassionate, more kind, that is ourselves. Hence, in our journey towards being ha happier, is actually becoming more human, more compassionate, and more responsible for ourselves and others. So this is a picture of a Buddha. We see that um, the Buddha actually holds a flower in his hand 
and on his on his um this is left on his left that you see the um the monk on on his left is actually his disciple so one day the buddha was teaching and then he stopped he held this this um hand and uh, this flower in his hand and he just stopped there so all the audiences all the disciples were just thinking oh what happened to the buddha aren't you teaching then you should be talking you should be explaining you should be telling us something this is what we have in mind if you teach i listen if you teach there should be sound there should be something some objects that's happening but at this moment, the Buddha just paused and took this flower in his hand and just put there. And this disciple here is Mahakasyapa. He understood the Buddha. He smiled at the Buddha. So this is one of the famous stories in the sutras. So when the Buddha was teaching, he held a flower in his hand. Everybody was questioning, but Mahakasyapa was able to resonate with the Buddha and smiled. What, is, what was the Buddha trying to express? Sometimes teaching is beyond words. It has to be heartfelt. So the teaching of metta or whatever Buddhist, um, um, Buddhist um, thinking that teachings that we are discussing, it has to be heartfelt. When it's heartfelt, we would be able to resonate and hence able to smile. That's my explanation of this, okay? So come back to ourselves. I'm sure that all of us, the hundred of us around here, we have spent our time effort, which is our lives, given this part of our life into the journey of participating in this meta convention. What do you want? Ask ourselves, what do I want? Perhaps, I would like to have heartfelt connection with the Buddha. So sometimes for this heartfelt connection to be possible, we do have to have little exercise. For example, imperfect is perfect. Are you able to acknowledge our imperfections? Sometimes we do have to. So acknowledging our imperfections helped us to accept ourselves as we are. And as we acknowledge this, reflect what we consider our weakness, write them down. At the same time, we could also reflect on what do we consider our strengths, write them down. Understand ourselves, and this is the step for us to have heartfelt matter. So, after writing all these, we could close our eyes, take three deep breaths, inhaling and exhaling slowly and tell ourselves, I'm trying my best. I don't need to be perfect. This is a very important self-recognition and also the building of our self-confidence. Then open our eyes and what do you notice? The world in front of us is brighter and we will always be able to smile. Um, Venerable Master Sing Yun, he, I, I said that he had diabetic for the last 50 years of his life. So the last 10 years of his life, he was almost blind. Um, he had a major stroke. There were a lot of difficulties with his physical body, but he always says that I'm just inconvenient. I'm just inconvenient. So how does he overcome that? You could see that this is his calligraphy in Chinese is Xing Hao Yi Chie Hao, which is if you have a good heart, everything will be good. Okay. And could you believe that this is written by someone who is almost blind? He can't see what he, ha he has written. So come to think for us, whenever I see his calligraphy, I'm actually very touched because I would ask myself if I can't see what would I be doing? If I can't see, what would I be doing? It is not only about, if I can't see, can I eat? If I can't see, can I take care of myself? You know, it is not only about this, but if I can't see, 
would I be in this state of anger towards myself? Why am I like that? But he is not. He's saying that, yeah, I'm a little bit inconvenient. I'll try the best that I could do. If I could still write, I write. If I could share my teachings with other people through my writings, I would do that to give others confidence. So come to think about ourselves. What do I live? How do I live my life? They believe that if your heart is good, everything will be good. So may every day be a good day, every moment be a good moment, and every moment be an enlightened and self-awakening one. With this, I would like to share with you today's, uh, I still actually have a little bit more, but I believe that this is another calligraphy that he has written. It's, it's wonderful to have you. It's wonderful to have you. Being appreciative of another person is not, it's not difficult, but it's also not that easy. So come back to ourselves, reflect on ourselves. If we want to have happiness, am I able to really say that it's wonderful to have you? We are definitely able to do that. So express thanks. And with this, thank you very much. Heartfelt matter, embrace inner connection. So I'd like to share with you a transfer of merits on this. Just listen to the singing. May everyone be well and all the best to you. Remember to smile. Thank you.